and welcome to our channel. It is the end of October and it's time to take a look at what we've been reading all month. Not quite sure how it got to the end of October already, but let's go ahead and get started. I'm starting us off today with my first book, which is The Shakespeare Thefts in Search of the First Folios by Eric Rasmussen. So yes, this is a book about books. My secret reading addiction is reading books about books. And this one was so much fun. So as you may or may not know, in 1623, the very first collection of William Shakespeare's works was printed in a volume called The First Folio. So it was very popular at the time and it is still very popular today. And as you can imagine, if you owned a first folio, it would be worth a lot of money. So there are only maybe 232 known copies of the first folio still in existence, but the catch is we don't know where all of those copies are. Some of them are known to exist, but they've been lost in time. And some of them, the owners just don't want you to know they have them because you might come and steal it from them, right? So enter Eric Rasmussen and his team of first folio hunters. They have gone all over the world for the past several years, tracking down and identifying each copy of the first folio and recording all the unique characteristics of each one. So that if one is stolen and it comes up for sale at auction or on the black market, it can be easily identified. So the stories he tells of all the things that they have gone through to get to look at these first folios is quite entertaining. My favorite story in the book is when he went to look at a first folio and it was brought out into a room where he could examine it, but also in the room was one of Madame Curie's old lab coats. So he looked at it and he's thinking, how long does uranium last on fabric? Am I being irradiated by Marie Curie while I'm sitting here looking at Shakespeare's first folio? So that was funny, but this is a great book for Shakespeare lovers, for book nerds like me, for homeschool or high school students studying Shakespeare. Shakespeare is so much fun. His plays were written for the stage and to be entertaining. And I think sometimes we make him so serious and we lose that. So this book can definitely make him come alive, make the colorful history of the first folios come alive. Definitely, it's a great one. I gave it five out of five stars. So my first book today is this unique little book Shadow Stalker by T.M. Gowett. And this book is like no other that I've ever read. It's almost hard to find words to describe this book, uh, but it follows Elijah, who is an investigative journalist, and it takes place over a day and a night as the world has cascaded into absolute chaos. Certain people have been struck by this violent madness that only they understand. And Elijah, as a journalist, obviously, is very interested in figuring out what's going on, even if that means he's out in the streets and out in the chaos. So the premise of this book is fascinating and it's very, very gripping. It only took me like two days to read this book. And it's also very insightful, very profound. The author has a lot of deep words on the concepts of sin and the power of forgiveness. So it will definitely leave you with a lot of food for thought. The book is violent, um, a little graphic in some places, not overly so, but just be aware of that. It would be best for older teens and adults. But if you want a crazy thriller read like no other, then definitely check this book out. It does not disappoint. This month, I read two different books about Pope John XXIII. And the first one was this one, The Humor and Warmth of Pope John XXIII, His Anecdotes and Legends. So some of you might recognize this one. It came from one of our giant bins of donated Catholic books and it's pretty much falling apart, but I read it anyway and I'm so glad I did because it was so good and I learned so much about him, um, about his love of people and he was so intelligent. He spoke so many different languages and he has such a sense of humor. For instance, once he was greeting visitors at the Vatican and a Protestant minister marched up to him and said, well, you know, I'm a Baptist. And the Pope just looked at him and said, well, I'm John. So I thought that was so funny. You know, 
John and the Baptist here together. The book also shows you his humanity. He was very lonely as the Pope. Evidently, it is a tradition for the Pope to eat alone, but that was too hard for John the 23rd. He loved people too much, so he broke with that tradition and he frequently had people dine with him. So who should read this book? Well, anyone who wants to get to know Pope John the 23rd in a more fun and informal type of way, I feel like it would be especially good for homeschooling kids because you could read a scholarly work about the life of John the 23rd, or you could read, you know, just some little blurb in a book about saints and he's in there, but that won't make him come alive like this book does. I'm so glad I got to know him better. The other book I read about him is this picture book called Just For Today, which is based on his writings. When he was seven years old, about to receive his first Holy Communion, he wrote out a statement that said, I want to be good to everyone. And he tried to live that his whole life. And as he grew older, he expanded that into 10 different statements called the Pope's Decalogue about how to live a holier life. So for instance, in the book, you find beautiful statements like, just for today, I will do a good deed and not tell anyone about it. Oh, and this one is my favorite. Just for today, I will not criticize anyone. I will not look to improve or discipline anyone besides myself. So I thought this was going to be a children's book, but I think really adults could also benefit from reading this book. I will say I'm not a super big fan of the illustrations, but the book is so good, I am willing to overlook that. I really think this is a great book. My next book is the exact opposite of my last book, and that is How High Can a Kangaroo Hop by Jackie French. So we picked this one up as part of our study of the history of Australia, just for something fun, just for something different. And this book, as you can probably tell from the title, is all about kangaroos and wallabies, which are part of the same family. And it doesn't look very long, right? But it's like this exhaustive guide to both of these animals. There is so much information in here, all about the different species and where they live and what they eat, their lifestyle, their history. Everything you'd ever want to know is packed into this book, even maps in the back showing you where the different species live. The book is also a lot of fun though. The author shares a lot of fun stories from her experience living in Australia and living with the animals, which was definitely my favorite part. There's even illustrations in here, even jokes. It's definitely not some sort of dry textbook. So we both learned a lot from this book. We both really enjoyed it and would recommend it for middle school on up. So my next book is The Four Seasons in Rome by Anthony Doerr. So get this, on the day that his wife Shauna gave birth to twin boys, Anthony Doerr went home and in his mailbox, he found a letter that said, congratulations, you have won a big literary prize and the award is going to Rome and spending a year there writing and basically doing whatever you want, all expenses paid. So then what do you do? Newborn twins a year in Rome, you pack up your newborn twins and you take them to Rome with your wife and live there for a whole year. So I enjoyed this story so much. You get to experience Rome and also parenthood for the first time through the eyes of the author. And while he was in Rome, he had time to work on his next book or short story. And he did do that, but he also spent a lot of time reading the works of famous people who had already been to Rome, like Pliny and Keats and Dante. He also got to know everyone in the neighborhood and he tried to learn Italian all while battling in insomnia because you know newborn twins. He happened to be in Rome the year that John Paul II died and although I don't know if the author is even religious, I mean he never really said much about his own faith, he was still very moved by the whole display of affection and love that the world showed for the passing of John Paul II. He was very touched by that. So I thought this book was an absolute treat. I was sorry when it ended, and I will definitely look for more books by the same author. So my last book today is A Saint in the Family by Corinna Turner, which is a collection of novellas and short stories from the I Am Margaret series. So I got this book for my birthday, and I'm not finished with it yet, as you can see from the bookmark. 
but there's something about reading the like little in-between moments from the series that is so much fun and so relaxing that just helps bring the characters and the stories and series all to life even more. A lot of the stories are also really sweet. The last one I read, Buttons, oh my gosh, I was like smiling the whole time I was reading it. I That one was definitely my favorite. And I also got a chance to read the prequel novella Brothers recently as well. And that book was five stars. But my only question to the author is why did you have to make that book so sad? Honestly, that book is short, but so good, yet it's so sad. I. <laughs> I really wish it had ended differently. If you've read it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you're a fan of the I Am Margaret series, I would definitely recommend grabbing a copy of this. There is even a like reading guide inside so you can see where all of these short stories fall, which is really, really helpful. So I can't recommend this series enough and I can't wait to finish this collection and see what happens. So I'm going to wrap this up today with a very quick review of The House of Sixty Fathers, which is the story of young Tian Pao, who lives in China during World War II, but he gets separated from his parents when the Chinese invade. So it's the story of all the adventures that he goes through trying to find his parents. Oh, so yeah, this book is so good, but it was so hard for me to read as a parent because isn't that every parent's worst nightmare, losing your child? So I'm just going to go ahead and give you a couple of spoilers right now that might make the book easier for you to read if you are a parent. If you don't want to hear the spoilers, just pause the video or fast forward through this part, but it will make me feel a lot better to say these things. Okay, here we go. Okay, number one, Glory of the Republic makes it through the story. He does not get eaten, so go Glory of the Republic. Number two, the story does have a happy ending. End of spoilers. Okay, so I think this is a great book to make World War II come alive, that time period, what was it like in China. I think students would really enjoy the action and adventure, everything that Tian Pao goes through and sees. So it's definitely a good book to read and maybe like you're tougher than I am. Like, this was so hard for me, but I'm so glad that I read it. I can definitely recommend it. All right, so that is a look at what we've been reading in the month of October. If you have read The House of Sixty Fathers, let me know in the comments what you thought. Was it easy for you to read? <laughs> so we hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.